So I'm doing my PhD here at Queen's, and I look at the interactions in between the nervous system and the immune system after a spinal cord injury, how those interactions result in the development of chronic pain, and how we can potentially alter those interactions to provide patients with pain relief. In my work, I use a mouse model of spinal cord injury that does a really good job at mimicking the human model of spinal cord injury. Although I usually don't tell people I just met that last part, because although we owe almost all of our medical modern advancements to the use of laboratory animals, their topic in research can be an uncomfortable one for many people, and some are completely against their use altogether. So in February of 2019, an article was published in the Queen's Journal titled, The Curtain on Animal Research at Queen's Lifts an Inch. I felt like it was a really negative depiction of animal use in research, and it suggested in a lot of ways that scientists were stuck in a rut and refused to adapt as technology moved forward. And indeed, if you look online, a lot of the journalism out there is about how we have advanced past the use of meeting animals. And a lot of people who do support animal research don't like to be too vocal and talk about it, because in the past, themselves or their families have been harmed or threatened. So I decided in March of 2019 to write kind of a response piece to this, and I titled it, A Letter from a Queen's Researcher, Animal Testing is Unfairly Judged. At the time, I published the article anonymously, and although I got a bunch of different friends from a variety of different backgrounds to read it over, and we had some really insightful discussions about it, I was a little bit nervous about how people would receive it. Some liked it, and others weren't such of a big fan. A lot of people thought, again, technology has advanced, we don't need animals in research anymore. Some thought that animal research was cruel and pointless, and others thought that it just wasn't right for us to subject animals to this use when there's alternatives. So I think that even though animal research is one of those uncomfortable topics, it's a little bit one of those ethically gray areas, it's important for us to talk about it. Because how can all of you make an informed stance on it if you are only given one side of the story? And I think in a time where there's increased public and patient engagement in research, this is becoming ever more important. So let's begin by talking about the legislation behind animal research. So, if you are a researcher or a university in Canada and you would like to use animals in any capacity, this does include animal testing, but it also includes animal observation, or if you're using them to train professionals, like training veterinarians or veterinarian technicians, you must obtain a certification of good animal practice from the Canadian Animal Care Committee. And this committee gives its certification out, and every three years it must be renewed, and how it gets renewed is that the Canadian Animal Care Committee will come to the institution on a surprise visit, so there's no tweaking things beforehand, um, and they will inspect every room, and they'll look at all the products being used and potentially any animals on study. And each university also has their own Animal Care Committee, but this committee is primarily concerned with um, the protocols and procedures that will be happening on site or in direct affiliation with the university. And animal care committees are composed of a variety of different peoples from different back backgrounds. There are researchers who do use animals in their work, as well as laboratory technicians who deal with the day-to-day -day care of animals and the university's head veterinarian. But there's also researchers who don't use animals in their work at all, or com community members who have no affiliation to the university. These protocols are approved based on the three R's of animal research, which are reduction, replacement, and refinement. Reduction is reducing the number of animals you would need in your study, and also being able to justify why you need the animal numbers that you do. Replacement can be either replacing your laboratory animal with an inanimate system, like a computational modeling system, or it could be replacing your animal with a less sentient version. And sentience has to do with how organisms can perceive and process the environment around them. So an example of this 
is replacing maybe a laboratory rat with a snail or a fish or an insect. And refinement has to do with altering the process itself to ensure the model organism is minimized in the amount of discomfort and pain it experiences. And the Animal Care Committee, each person must be okay with the protocol that gets approved. So it's not a situation where one person can just be overpowered by everyone else on the committee. So another comment I, comment I commonly get is that technology has advanced to a point where we just don't need animals anymore. And don't get me wrong, there's been some phenomenal advancements with computational modeling and cell and tissue culturing techniques. And, but the issue is, if we want to create therapeutics for human use, we are not yet at a point where animals and their products can be completely cut out of the research process without it greatly hindering things. Another amazing advancement that's been happening is that scientific groups and communities have moved towards sharing their large data sets, as well as creating public databases for people to use free of cost. So let's say, for example, there's a group out there who's particularly interested in gene changes that happen in immune cells after a spinal cord injury. Perhaps they obtain some blood samples from spinal cord injury patients, and they run an analysis on it, and they get a huge amount of data. When they're ready to publish their findings in a scientific journal, they have to release the entirety of the data set to the public for anyone to use. I could, for then, I could download this data set, maybe I run a different analysis and pick out a couple different gene targets. I could then move to a different public database, one of which is called ImGen, and see what the gene expression levels are in up to 85 different immune cells. I could then head back to my lab and use cultured cell lines to see if I alter the gene expression of this immune cell, how does that activity of the cell change? Some labs even have the equipment to 3D print small organs, so we can see how the organ as a total will change. But of course, all of these techniques do a great job at reducing the number of organisms we'd need, because before we even move into a disease model, we might have already eliminated a couple targets of interest, or maybe we have a better idea of the disease mechanism itself. But the issue is, cells in a Petri dish lack the overall organ architecture, which in some diseases can be super important. And a 3D printed organ lacks the interactions that happen with other organs. We are not just a collection of a bunch of organisms or a bunch of organs really close together. All our organs communicate with one another, and the circulatory and immune system play a huge role. Another issue is that each one of our cells contains the exact same copy of DNA. And this means that different cell types could express the same genes or produce the same proteins. So that's sometimes why, when there are new drugs or new therapeutics, you see off-targeted effects that you didn't originally think would happen. Another important thing to consider is causation versus correlation. So what do I mean by this? Maybe you took some blood samples from patients with and without chronic low back pain. And maybe in your chronic low back pain population, you saw an increased level of a certain protein. You cannot assume that that increase of protein is what's causing people's pain. And it's not ethical to then medicate your patients to lower that protein level. Which then kind of brings us to a trickier criticism of animal research, which is how can you say that the life of a human is more important than the life of an animal. So going back to the three R's of animal research, sentience, um, which is in the replacement R, can refer to the ability of an organism to sense the environment around it and process it. And it's a very delicate balance of using the least sentient organism possible, but still being able to get clinically relevant data. So science has, to a certain extent, created a hierarchy of organism life. And even though there are differences between humans and animals, animals are con still contributing massively to the biomedical science process. For example, a recent development out of the University of Calgary it has been that they found that if you 
give MS patients or multiple sclerosis patients minocycline, which is a common acne medication. After their first MS event, they will reduce by half the rate that they could go on to develop chronic MS. And this is a huge finding for Canada because in Canada we have one of the highest rates of MS in the world. So this finding has done a great job of improving the quality of life of thousands of people and would not have been possible without the mouse model of multiple sclerosis. And also if you are a diabetic who's ever taken insulin or maybe an Advil or an aspirin, or you went in for a routine surgery and had to was prescribed antibiotics or painkillers, you have animal research to thank because of that. And the reality is scientists at this time are just using the best models that they have available. If a non-animal model was to come along that was as good as or better than the animal models that we currently use, science would move to adapt to use that one. But at this point, we don't have those models available for a lot of diseases. And at the end of the day, it's okay if you're uncomfortable with animal research. It's a very uncomfortable topic. But supporting animal research doesn't need to be an all or nothing approach. You can support the use of animals in biomedical research, but maybe you don't support their use in cosmetic research. Or you can read a scientific journal article and be really critical about the methods that they used or the conclusions that they drew from their study, but making generalized blanket statements like all animal research is barbaric and unnecessary is simply untrue. So why do I use animals in my work? So like I mentioned, I study chronic pain that develops after a spinal cord injury. And in the province of Ontario, 11 people each week will suffer from a spinal cord injury. And for each one of these patients, it will take them approximately two to three years to stabilize. And when they do finally stabilize, they are often faced with a whole host of medical complications. Even though the trauma itself is to the central nervous system, many different body systems can be affected. For example, heart rate, breathing, blood pressure, the digestive system, the urinary tract system, movement, the musculoskeletal system, and mental health can all be affected. And for 60 to 80% of these patients, they will go on to develop chronic pain. And at this point, doctors don't really have a lot of effective treatments to offer this population. And of the treatments that they do have available, many of them do not lower the patient's pain to a rate where they can live a healthy, productive life that they would like to live. So through the use of computational modeling, cell and tissue culturing techniques, microbiome analysis, and a new mouse model of spinal cord injury that I developed that more accurately mimics a human spinal cord injury, I hope to go on to help develop better therapeutics to offer these patients some pain relief. And at the end of the day, I know my research will be difficult and it will of course have limitations to it. But I know that people would not be able to live the quality of life that they currently do without the irreplaceable contribution of many laboratory animals over the years. Thank you.